Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. All of it brought to you by a brand new sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights and a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash martini. We'll tell you a lot more about what they offer in just a little bit. Jim, we actually have a good martini today, so that's good news in and of itself. We go to the editorial page of USA Today as they're taking a look at Bernie Sanders' version of Medicare for All. Now, to be sure, USA Today likes government involvement in health care. They just like a little more incremental approach, so we're not exactly in lockstep with these people. But they are saying that uh, Bernie Sanders is nuts pretty much when it comes to his Medicare for All, and here's part of what they say. But Sanders' plan has intrinsic drawbacks, most notably its soak-the-rich approach and its lack of cost control such as co-pays. What stands out is the utter impracticality of getting from where things stand today to what he proposes. In an era of intense political polarization, no measure that disrupts insurance for more than 100 million Americans, most of them reasonably satisfied with their coverage, would get through Congress. Even if Democrats managed to reclaim the supermajority they once had, many in their own ranks would balk once they began refocusing on the mechanics of leaping from today's fragmented system to a single-payer system in one fell swoop. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, which has long been the gold standard for estimating the cost of legislation, looked at Sanders' plan and decided there were too many unknowns to produce a hard number. But CBO did say that implementing it would be complicated, challenging, and potentially disruptive. The combination of generous benefits and lower payments to health care providers could create, quote, a shortage of providers, longer wait times, and changes in the quality of care, CBO warned last week. So, Jim... The uh, utopia of single-payer health care. Even the folks at USA Today know that this is not where we want to go. Yeah, and I want to give USA Today editors credit for basically calling out what I, something that needs to be called out a lot more frequently. And I see the discussion of, oh, we can, you know, this, this hand-waving idea of we can put everybody on Medicare for all and no one will pay any more and no one will be uh, frustrated with their coverage and no one will feel like they've got excessive wait times and and utopia will dawn, um, you could argue that this is an extension of, there's always been politicians who've promised something for nothing. I think the situation is getting worse. And if you want to, if folks on the left want to point to Trump saying, we're going to build a big, beautiful wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. And, uh, you know, every time somebody doubted it, he'd say the wall got 10 feet taller, you know, fine. Um, <laughs> it is worth noting that for, you know, a good couple presidential cycles, you would have a Democratic candidate who would promise to not touch entitlements to argue that Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare were either running fine and nothing needed to be done, or the only thing that needed to be done was to raise taxes on the rich. And there was no need to contemplate means testing. There was no need to contemplate uh, giving people individual retirement accounts to invest for their future through Social Security. Uh, Certainly, you couldn't, couldn't touch any of the existing entitlement programs. Republicans generally endorsed it. Probably Romney and Ryan did this the most. And, of course, the voting public, by and large, prefer the Democrats. Entitlement reform, telling people they can't get something for nothing, has never been popular. So for the first time in a long while, in 2016, Republicans nominated somebody who wasn't running on that. You know, Donald Trump was saying he wasn't going to touch Medicaid, Medicare, or Social Security. Leave it as it is. And Trump won. Uh, the voters have rewarded bad behavior, not just on Trump, you know, personally and, and all that stuff, but a sense of voters like hearing unrealistic promises. They like hearing that they can get something for nothing. Um, you look at healthcare reform, basically the old saying is, you know, fast, good, or cheap, pick any two. You can't get fast, cheap, and good simultaneously. Uh, the money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, the supply of doctors is not high enough. Uh, to give everybody to, to have short uh, waiting times. Um, and of course, it takes time to train good doctors. You can't just, there's no assembly line where you can just say, okay, let's churn out more good doctors to give people more good care. And, you know, people, the, the people do not like to acknowledge this. Bernie Sanders' plan is a chunk of this. You could probably argue that the Green New Deal, which says we're going to save the environment, reverse climate change, and it won't cost you anything. And oh, by the way, We're going to completely refurbish and and redo every building in America and we'll stop the cows from farting and and all these, you know, it's these remarkable sweeping 
pie in the sky ideas um, that make, I, I'd argue, make covering a presidential campaign kind of annoying because I know none of these things can become law. If somebody's coming along saying, hey, you know that idea that's never been able to get done, that's always proved to be too complicated to work? I alone can do this. You should exercise some skepticism. So I give credit to USA Today for finally stepping in and saying, no, Medicare for all is not going to leave everybody happy. Yeah. Truth hurts sometimes, but uh, we need more of it. And uh, the politicians don't want to give it to us. The media don't want to give it to us, depending on uh, who it hurts or who it helps sometimes. Uh, but we need the facts. And in this case, the USA Today editorial board at least provided some of them. I just want to go back to, to one line here. This, the Congressional Budget Office looked at Sanders' plan and decided there were too many unknowns to produce a hard number. That's a really bad way to look at policy. And it's a really bad way to look at running your business, because if you don't know your number, Numbers, you don't know your business. But the problem growing businesses have that keeps them from knowing their numbers is their hodgepodge of business systems. They have one system for accounting, another for sales, another for inventory, and so on. It's just a big, inefficient mess, taking up too much time and too many resources. And that hurts the bottom line. Greg, I want to salute you for an exceptionally smooth transition into the ad. <laughs> Introducing NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform, giving you the visibility and control you need to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance, and accounting, orders, and human resources instantly right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. And right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash martini. That's netsuite.com slash martini to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash martini. All right, Jim, let's move to our bad martini now. And we head to the presidential campaign of Cory Booker. He's looking for a way to stand out in this field of, what we say, 24, probably, at least in the next coming days. Uh, and so he's decided, hey, why don't I just hijack an idea from a guy who has zero chance of winning this nomination? And that would be Eric Swalwell, who, of course, even before he started running for president, was talking about uh, an assault weapons ban. We can talk about how they define assault weapons. The government's going to buy them back, even though they didn't sell them to you in the first place. And in the Swalwell plan... If you don't sell them back to the government, they're going to come get you and put you in jail. And so Cory Booker says he wants an assault weapons ban. And so credit to Poppy Harlow at CNN here for asking him whether his plan is like the Swalwell plan. Here's their extended exchange. Congressman Eric Swalwell has also, like you, proposed an assault weapons ban. But he's proposing a buyback program where Americans who currently have those guns uh, could sell them essentially to the government. But if they don't, within a certain period of time, they would be prosecuted, so subject to be thrown in jail, perhaps. Are you supportive of the same measure? Well, first of all, when I was mayor of the city of Newark, again, I have a record on dealing with gun violence. We, we did a lot of uh, gun buybacks and even other creative ideas that I think uh, we should have uh, uh, when I'm president of the United States. The critical thing is I think most Americans uh, agree that these weapons of war uh, should not be on our streets. But, Again, but would, some... you, would you prosecute people? Do you support the government buying them back? And if not, potentially people could go to jail if they don't want to sell them back. Yes or no? Uh, again, we should have a law that bans these weapons, and we should have a reasonable period in which people can turn in these weapons. Uh, right now, we have a nation that allows, in streets and communities like mine, these weapons that should not exist. <laughs> Jim, if you didn't want to put him in prison, I think that'd be a fairly easy answer. So I think we know what the answer is, even though we didn't say it. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify, Greg, um, Cory Booker, both throughout his career as mayor of Newark in the U.S. Senate, now as a presidential candidate, he's always supported criminal justice reform, which generally believes in, you know, letting people out of prison sooner, job training, maybe decriminalizing certain elements of, of drug use or things like that. But he also wants to take a whole millions upon millions of Americans who are not currently breaking any laws and criminalize them. <laughs> Cory Booker looks at America and he says, you know, the problem is we've got a whole bunch of people in jail who shouldn't be there. We've got a whole bunch of Americans who aren't in jail who should be there. You know, let you decide which side you're on. I had said this uh, to my buddy Cam Edwards yesterday when, when, you know, Booker was laying this out. A lot of these guys who propose these ideas never really think through 
how they're going to enforce that. I noticed, by the way, he says they have a certain amount of time to turn these weapons in. Is there going to be any compensation? Because those those weapons they don't grow on trees. You don't, they don't you know you don't they don't hand them out for free. Most people have uh, you know spent a considerable chunk of change on their gun collection, and whether they use it for sport shooting, whether they use it for hunting, whether they use it for personal protection, you know, whatever choice they have, you know, whatever reason they've done it, you're basically saying, hi, we're the federal government. We're going to take this from you. And oh, by the way, no, you don't get any compensation. We've decided what you own, what you bought perfectly legally. Uh, we've decided to now criminalize. And assumingly, if you if we find this you know, on you or in your house during a search of your house, we would then charge you with a crime for illegal possession of something that was perfectly legal when you purchased it. The next question also is then was, well, how will you enforce it? Uh, unless you're willing to do a house-to-house search of every community in the country, a whole bunch of people are going to continue to possess these things. Um, and, and so the whole the whole logistics of this are pretty, you know, if not unworkable, would require an expansion of the American police state in a way that no tough-on-crime uh, uh, politician of the last two generations has ever contemplated. And yet, in order to you know get get you know here's when they say get these guns off the streets. These guns aren't on the streets. They're in people's homes. And for some reason, Cory Booker seems to think that with a wave of his hand, legislation, which, oh, by the way, like he's in the Senate. He could always introduce this stuff and try to get it passed. But somehow as president, he's going to want to do this. Uh, one other wrinkle just to add on, on the Cory Booker gun platform. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, Greg, you know what else he wants to ban? What? Bump stocks. <laughs> you know what else is currently banned? Bump stocks. Bump stocks. <laughs> he like it didn't notice. <laughs> Happened earlier in the year. Kind of a little bit of controversy. There, you know, I'd say about, uh, let's say, 5 to 10% of NRA members uh, either have gun stocks, bump stocks, or have a you know, position of like, well, wait a second. You know, similar thing of like, if I bought this legally, you government should not retroactively declare, oh, this is illegal now, and you're in trouble if you have one. And, you know, you have lots of NRA members and gun owners don't use them, but they kind of feel like there's this fair argument of, wait a second, if the government's going to suddenly declare something illegal, then don't I deserve some compensation if you're going to take something from me or I'm going to be legally required to destroy it? Um, now, by the way, this is a regulation. I heard some people trying to insist. Well, what Cory Booker is saying is he's saying that the ban should be done legislatively, not just re- through regulations. OK, he's a senator. He can do that. <laughs> Why does he need to be in the Oval Office to get the Senate to pass something? Good question. So anyway, that's uh, that's the Cory Booker logic on guns right now. I can't remember if it was Cam or someone else uh, yesterday or whenever this first came out, maybe it was the day before, that said there's about 200,000 people in prison in the federal prison system right now, and about 30,000 of those are there on gun crimes. There are tens of millions of gun owners in this country, many of whom uh, possess the weapons completely legally, by the way, that Cory Booker wants to ban. So, yeah, the uh, the chore of actually rounding up those people would be quite intense, uh, to say the least. But I liked your uh, hearkening back to Al Gore in 1992 there with uh, the, peop- the wrong people are in prison and the right people are out of prison and that sort of thing. That reminds me of his whole, everything that should be down is up, and everything that is up should be down. You know, I get a lot of credit for the impressions I do on this show, but that's, that's disturbingly good, Greg. Uh, <laughs> As far as I can tell, since you know, people may or may not know, we tape in different places. You may have actually just been abducted, and you're and you're trapped under something something heavy. Your your voice is being muffled in the background, and Al Gore has actually hijacked the podcast. Judging by from what I'm hearing on the other end of my microphone, uh, I'd be talking about ice shelves or something already if he was really here. But uh, thank you, I do lock a- box. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the uh, final martini now. And this one definitely is crazy. Jim, we generally have an aversion to uh, headlines that say Democrat or Republican lawmaker does or says X, because usually that means it's somebody we've never heard of and it probably doesn't deserve a ton of attention. And this is a guy I hadn't heard of till yesterday, but he's getting a ton of attention. And this guy actually deserves the blowback that he's getting. His name is Brian Sims. He's a Democratic state representative in Pennsylvania, I assume from Philadelphia, because he certainly loves hanging out on the sidewalk in front of the Philadelphia Planned Parenthood office in the southeastern part of the city. And so uh, a couple different uh, clips from videos here. The one that really went viral is when he just decided to berate for almost nine minutes this uh, senior citizen who was simply out front praying for the people who are coming to the Planned Parenthood Clinic, hoping that they would not abort their children, uh, and and hoping to talk to them and talk them out of doing such a thing. So uh, here's that particular encounter. Who would have thought that an old white lady would be out in front of a Planned Parenthood telling people what's right for their bodies? Shame on you. 
Shame on you for hiding your face at the same time that you're shaming other people. Again, the same laws that protect me protect you, and, and that's okay. You're allowed to be out here. That doesn't mean that you have a moral right to be out here. Shame on you. What you're doing here is disgusting. This is wrong. You have no business being out here. You have every right to be here, but you have no business being out here. Then there's this other video where he's harassing three teenage girls, calling them white, even though one of them is not, uh, and basically doing the same thing to them. And this time, uh, as he's live streaming this, inviting his friends and followers, he'll pay them $100 if they out these people. So here's the deal. I've got $100 to anybody who will identify any of these three. So we're I'm going to donate to Planned Parenthood. I'm going to donate to Planned Parenthood. And so look, a bunch of war. white people standing out in front of a Planned Parenthood. Shaming people. Really There's nothing Christian about what you're doing. I'm nothing Christian at all about what you're doing. Hi, nothing Christian or loving or godly about what you're doing. So he called them Bible bullies on Twitter and so forth. So, uh, Jim, obviously, if there was footage of uh, somebody deeply harassing people trying to get into the clinic, that would go viral and then CNN and everybody would be all over it. Uh, not a lot of attention to this guy. Yeah, I mean, it's worth, it is worth watching yourself for starters because, in case you think, oh, maybe this thing is selectively edited or. Uh, I, I'm really not sure the audio does it justice. This woman who's praying is just a woman who's praying. I, I, this, this, she's not chanting anything. She's not um, uh, waving any signs or placards. There's nothing menacing. This is a woman praying the rosary. And whether, you know, whatever your perspective on abortion, I'd like you to think, hey, you know what? She can pray outside on the sidewalk. That's not, you know, that's no menace to anyone. Um this idea that he, should, he he is exhibiting all of the behaviors and traits that he claims to be denouncing. He says they're shaming people who go in. Again, we don't, we don't see anything on this video. Uh, and then he starts saying, shame on you. The, 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 as I was discussing with um, Hugh Hewitt earlier this morning, this is actually kind of an, a somewhat uncomfortable video to watch. And, and if you, you know, after a few minutes you want to turn it off, I'll understand. Um, but this, this, this man is really dr driven by hate. This man is driven by a full-on rage against these people who have the audacity to pray outside of a Planned Parenthood clinic. Now, you know, and he keeps you know, making this blurry line when you've got a right to be out here, but you've got no moral right to be out here. You know, he, you clearly, this is a guy who, if he had a chance, you know, it feels like he's like one uh, moment away from, from striking these people. There's like this barely contained rage. And the other thing is that he's recording himself. He thinks he looks good in this interaction. He thinks he's being heroic. He thinks he's standing up against the Inquisition. When in fact, it's just you know, a first an old woman and then three younger women um, calls them racist. You know, first of all, dear people of Philadelphia, are you, are you sure you want this guy representing you in the state legislature? Are you, are you sure there's not something? Uh, pick another pro-choice guy, fine. Pick another liberal progressive, fine. But this guy, there's a weird bullying uh, mentality to this guy. I, I, I really kind of wonder if his alphabet goes all the way to Z. Um, because he's just this, like, if this, this enrage, he seeks out this confrontation. Um, and maybe, maybe we're doing what exactly what he wants. Maybe he wanted this to go viral. Maybe he wanted to uh, become a national figure. But I think there is value in saying, no, <laughs> never mind. This is not what you're supposed to do as a state legislator. This is not something you're supposed to do as a human being. You're not supposed to go up to people who are, you know, in any other context, people would be justifiably screaming. This is a religious bigotry. He says all kinds of nasty things to that woman who's praying the rosary, uh, sneering about the Catholic Church. This is a, you know, this is a hate-filled human being. And I think that's, um, the great, of course, the great irony is I'm sure this person thinks he's standing up against hate and he probably has no hate uh, as a bumper sticker or something like that. I genuinely fear that this guy is one step away from having some sort of physical confrontation with people. Um, and so I think this is definitely worth calling out is one of the most disturbing behavior. Like we all say, ah, imagine these, you know, uh, crazy local lawmakers or something. Last week I wrote about a uh, member of the Indianapolis city council who accused Shapiro's deli of feeding Nazis <laughs> because it had said, Hey, NRA members, come on down and enjoy this. Place. There is something really twisted and unhinged and out of control in today's democratic party. And it would be nice if you could have a broad bipartisan consensus to say, Whoa, Whoa, time out. Hold on. That is unacceptable. That is crossing a line. That is beyond the pale of acceptable discourse in this country. And oh, by the way, like, you know, at a time when we're worried about, <clears throat> you know, mass shootings at baseball fields, uh, shooting of Gabby Gifford, you know, this, this idea of this, you know, partisan rage turning into violence. 
um, you know, this is unnerving to see an elected official seeming to, to you know, want to, you know, burst forth with that. Uh, and just, you know, one last kind of closing thought. Con- compare the amount of coverage and discussion of this, Greg, to say the Covington teens. Yes. Who said nothing? Yeah. So there you go. So. Uh, again, you know, first of all, if I were a Pennsylvania state legislator, I'd sure as heck be intri- intrigued by the idea of impeaching this guy for just behaving in a way that embarrasses the entire institution. Um, and again, also possibly psychological examination. He really looks like he wants to get into a fight with a net with a poor little old lady praying the, ro- the rosary. Um, that's not normal behavior, Greg. No, no. And a couple of quick points, because in the second video, the adult who's with the teenage girls tries to explain what they're really doing there, and he doesn't want any part of it. He's not part of any debate that that he wants to have happen there. He's just there to shout them down and intimidate them. And I wish I could say that uh, there's universal condemnation of his tactics, but I actually watched the video. Somebody on Twitter linked to his actual, I think it was a Periscope page, and obviously the people that follow him generally agree with him, but the hearts and the positive comments were just flooding uh, on that uh, video. So, uh, yes, those of us on this side of the issue and who are generally sane are coming to the same conclusion here. But to those who are completely in the tank for the agenda or for Brian Sims himself, uh, they're loving this stuff. So the divide is about as rigid as you could imagine right now. Yeah, I just gave two closing thoughts, one being that, uh, look, people – seek out a purpose in life they want to feel meaningful they want to feel like that what they why they get up in the morning they make a change in the world they try to make the world a better place um if if you're a pro-choice and for some reason you listen to greg and i every day and you're like oh i can't stand those guys whatever your view i hope you don't turn out like this guy uh this this guy really does seem to be going down a very dangerous path now let's just observe, like, we, we all recognize hatred when it comes in the forms of backwards losers wearing white robes and skinheads and stuff like that. This guy is just bristling with hate towards these pro-life uh, uh, you know, activists who, by the way, aren't even all that active. And he's, and, you know, and we should, my attitude, we want to stand up against hate. This would be a good example of hate we can stand up against. So my friends on the left, join me and, uh, you know, together, hopefully we'll make the world a more pleasant, more polite, more respectful place. Jim, nicely said. On that note, we'll reconvene tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Please don't forget to visit our sponsor to get your business numbers in order. That's netsuite.com slash martini and get that free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits. And tune in again Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.